Good evening and welcome, family and friends. Um, glad to have you be joining with us as we consider uh, the life of Jesus. Once again, through Luke's gospel, and of course, um, in considering his entire life, we are going to look at uh, some of the other gospel records as well concerning certain events in Jesus' life, and that's certainly the case this evening. Anyway, good to be back with you. Um, I know that some are uh, family looking into this. Glad to have you uh, here, and it's really big, been a big part of my my desire with this is to reach out to my family and friends, and um, like I said last time, um, you know, I'm going to be very transparent. I do have a particular agenda in looking at this, and that is to reach out to my Catholic family and friends who I think have misunderstandings concerning Jesus and really a lot of eternal things um, being misguided by the Catholic Church. And um, my cousin Mike uh, Bradley asked a couple of good questions that have really been on my heart the last couple of weeks. And I know I said I was going to address those in a, um, a letter form and answer the questions that way. But I thought what I would rather do is cover those in a lesson because we're going to be coming up to some of those questions in the life of Jesus um, probably next week as we get into his adult life. I do want to look at some things in addressing the questions that were asked by Mike. So, uh, Mike, haven't forgotten about those. I don't know if you've been looking for any kind of response yet. But um, I think I'd rather do it uh, in this means as a, as a lesson format. I think I can probably maybe get my thoughts out a little bit better and use the scripture a little bit clearer. So we will do that. Um, this evening we're going to continue looking at the uh, very, very early years of Jesus, in particular his birth and the events that uh, followed that um, up until he was about two years old. And even until he's a little bit older here in Luke's record, as we kind of close out this particular phase of his life um, in the very beginning. So like I like to always do, I do want to begin with a word of prayer. And uh, so we will do that at this time. Father in heaven, thank you for your goodness and for your mercy. Father, thank you for your, this gift of your word that you have given to us that we might learn of you, that we even might learn of ourselves and our relationship with you. Father, I pray as we study these gospels, especially Luke's gospel, that we would not only learn about the life of Jesus, but most importantly, what it relates to us, what it means to us in our lives, how important these things are in his life, in his doctrines, in his teaching, establishing um, your church. Father, I pray that you would help us to understand. Father, give me grace as I try to teach. Give all of us hearts of understanding. Open up our minds. Help us to understand these truths that we might make necessary changes in our lives to follow after you more according to your word. And Father, that we might especially be witnesses to those that do not know you in the free pardon of sin of salvation. Father, I ask that you forgive us where we fail you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so <clears throat> hopefully you have your Bibles with you. We're going to be considering two chapters mainly, Matthew chapter 2 and Luke chapter 2, and we will conclude, as I said, uh, the early, early years of Jesus um, after his birth. Now, we talked about his birth last week, um, looking at some of the events surrounding it, talking about some of the, uh, again, the Catholic misconceptions concerning Mary. Um, again, a main doctrine of the Catholic Church is that she is a, uh, was, even still is a perpetual virgin, um, that she ascended bodily into heaven, that she never had a relationship with a man, um, and that doesn't seem to be the case, uh, according to the scriptures, which is the record that we use. There is no reason to consider any other source. Um, and I did mention to you that so many of the teachings concerning Mary especially came came about uh, in the Roman Catholic Church as she began to evolve over the centuries, around the 6th century, um, mainly, um, with her, um, what's called the Immaculate Conception, 
the fact that she is born was born without original sin. Um, that's simply not true. That is not biblical. It's not scriptural. And uh, to say that she ascended bodily into heaven without facing death um, is also an extreme stretch. The scriptures never indicate any such thing. So maybe putting a little bit too much emphasis on Mary, the woman who was really the mother of Jesus. And I don't say that in any way to lessen her importance in the scriptures. Um, she clearly was a blessed woman. The scriptures clearly say that. So <clears throat> we're going to consider the after events of his birth. I want to start reading in Matthew. I'll probably do a lot of reading. I'd like for you to follow along if you would. Uh, Matthew chapter 2 here is going to be the first part of our consideration for this evening. And in Matthew uh, chapter 2, verse 1, and what I'll do is I'll read, make some uh, comments as we go through, and write some notes down in your Bibles, even questions, and maybe we can address some of those um, if you see need to, or study them for yourselves. Um, that's really a big desire of mine, is to impart some ideas and thoughts that maybe you've never considered before, and uh, perhaps have you study them for yourselves to get better clarification. So Matthew chapter 2, verse 1 says, Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem, Judea, oh, we also talked about the prophecies last week concerning um, his birth. And of course, Bethlehem was a big part of that, uh, one of the fulfilled prophecies. So he was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king. And behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. So now a couple of things here that I think are noteworthy. And that, that probably minor. Um, I'm not sure if I mentioned these last time or not, but I'm going to go ahead and say it again anyway. But so much of what we see with the, the Christmas scene um, is, is misconception. It's not It's not really the way it was in the scriptures, and it gives us, sort of a false um, idea of how things really were at this time. Um, yes, he was born in a manger. No, he was not born on December 25th, was not in the winter time. Probably it was either um, in the fall time, um, probably the, the fall, actually, uh, late summer, early fall uh, is when he most likely was born. And all the events that we see with the, with the manger scene, you know, with the shepherds being there, the sheep, the different animals, and then the wise men that are standing there as well, bearing gifts to Jesus, um, the king, as they see him. That didn't happen, that part of it didn't happen until much later, a year or so um, later, maybe up to two years later, uh, when these things began to be. Um, but somehow history has kind of lumped everything all together. So again, maybe a minor point, um, nothing to lose sleep over, of course, but certainly to give us a complete understanding of the events and how they worked out as the babe began to grow, you know, in his toddler years um, is when this event most likely was um, happening. So it says, Herod the king um, had heard these things. He was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he demanded of them where the Christ should be born. And they said unto him, Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet. And, and there's the quote, and thou in Bethlehem of Judea are not the least among the princes of Judah, for out of thee shall come a governor and he shall rule my people. Uh, then Herod, when he had privately called his wise men, inquired of them diligently what time the star appeared. And he sent them uh, to Bethlehem and, they, and said to them, Go, search diligently for the young child. When you found him, bring word again uh, to me that I may come worship him as also. When they had heard the king, they departed, and lo, the star, which they had seen in the east, went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. Uh, when, the, uh, when they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceedingly great joy. When they came into the house, they saw the young child and Mary his mother and fell down and worshipped him. 
And when they opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And being warned of God in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed into their own country another way. So here's the events. Pretty simple to understand. Um, took quite some time for this to unfold. It did not happen the very night that Jesus was born. Um, there was a star that led these men to where the Messiah was. There, in heaven itself made no secret that the Messiah was born. God was not trying to hide anything uh, about the Messiah being born. But in God's word, there is a time schedule that Jesus was on from his birth unto his death. And this, and this event here, really what Herod was up to was trying to destroy this child whom uh, the Jews were claiming was going to be their king. He was going to cut it off right at the beginning and actually eliminate this child um, from uh, growing up into being the king. Um, and these wise men, um, they are uh, magi uh, is what they are called, but they are representatives of some of the eastern uh, nations. And they came um, as they would with any royalty that is born and they brought gifts expensive gifts uh, to the child and to his his parents but it also says when they came into the house and so Jesus when he was born it was not a house it was a manger um, probably relatives uh, is where they were staying here at this time um, but nonetheless they found Jesus uh, with Mary his mother and fell down and worshiped him it is interesting to note also that there's not really a whole lot about Joseph that is mentioned, um, not even in these early. It's all really focused about uh, about Mary. Um, we're going to see in a little bit where the an angel does speak to Joseph, and he does kind of take charge of this event. But as, as the time goes on, um, Joseph kind of takes a back seat a little bit to a lot of these things. And then by the time Jesus is an adult, Joseph is uh, really completely out of the picture. But um, in any case, uh, they find the child here. And then they were warned by God in a dream that they should not uh, return to Herod. Uh, and they obeyed that vision and went another direction. So in verse 13, it says, When they had departed, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph now in a dream, saying, Arise and take the young child and his mother and flee to Egypt. And thou shalt there, uh, thou shalt there remain until um, I bring you word. For Herod will seek the child to destroy him. When he arose, he took the young child and his mother by night, and departed to Egypt. Did this right away, um, being obedient to this angelic vision. And this angel, um, most likely the same angel that has been involved in this, um, most likely the angel Gabriel, uh, is the one that is with uh, doing these things. So verse 15 now says, and um, they were there until the death of Herod, that it might be fulfilled, which is spoken of by the Lord, uh, by the prophet saying, out of Egypt, I have called my son. That, that's an interesting statement. And I don't want to go, I can't go too much into that at this time during this lesson, but there's an interesting um, point to be made there where, God called what is referred to as his son, Israel, out of Egypt. You'll recall that, you know, going back many, many years before this time, the Jews were uh, slaves in Egypt, and God actually sent a deliverer, Moses, to them to deliver them out of their bondage in Egypt. Now, this event is happening here, and it says, out of Egypt, I have called my son. And there's a, a prophecy, a prophetic verse that it almost has like a double meaning to it, where you could take it to be referring to Israel being called out of Egypt, because in the context it would very read very well that way. But then also um, the Bible makes this application here with the Son, uh, the Son of God, Jesus, being called out of Egypt. Now verse 16 says, then when Herod, <clears throat> Then Herod, when he saw that he was mocked of the wise men, was exceeding wroth. And sent forth and slew all the children of Bethlehem in all the coasts thereof in the, from two years old and under, according to the time which he had diligently inquired of the wise men. So again, a two-year 
time period here is what we're considering. So verse 17 now says, uh, then was fulfilled that which was spoken of by uh, Jeremy, my King James says, Jeremiah, really the prophet, saying, in Ramah was there a voice heard, lamentation and weeping, and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children, and would not be comforted because they are not. So the Bible here makes a direct um, prophecy fulfillment with this event now concerning that one of Jeremiah. So lots of prophetic things happening here. Uh, it's a very spiritual time. Verse 19, but when Herod was dead, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared unto Joseph in a dream uh, in Egypt, saying, Arise now and take the young child and his mother and go into the land of Israel, for they are dead, which sought the child's life. And he arose, took the young child and his mother, and came into the land of Israel. When he heard that Archelaus did reign in Judea the, uh, in the room of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there, notwithstanding. Being warned of God in a dream, he turned aside and to parts of Galilee. And he came and dwelt in the city of Nazareth, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of by the prophets, he shall be called a Nazarene. So it, it's interesting to me how God, in, in the events of the life of Jesus, is kind of maneuvering and manipulating Joseph in these dreams on where to take the child and what to do, all for the purpose of fulfilling certain prophecies takes him to Galilee, um, to the city of Nazareth, because it says that he shall be called a Nazarene. And a lot of Jesus' ministry, early ministry, began in Nazareth. And there's one place in his ministry, which we'll eventually get to, where they question uh, when it's announced that the Messiah has come um, out of those parts. The question is brought up, how, can anything good come, come out of Nazareth? So God working um, kind of behind the scenes here with the early life of Jesus. So we're going to go now over to the book of Luke. And again, it, I, I find it interesting that of the four Gospels, only two of them really talk about the early days of Jesus. Um, Mark picks up right with John the Baptist and the baptism of Jesus. And then, of course, John in his unique way talks about the eternal past of Jesus and uh, then gets right into his ministry, moving very quickly uh, through the life of Jesus and his ministry. In Luke chapter 2, now we read a lot of this last week concerning the birth of Jesus, concerning Mary and Joseph, and now we're going to consider the last part of Luke chapter 2, starting in verse 22. So this lesson tonight um, really is just going to be a stage setter, kind of fill the gaps of the early days of Jesus. Um, I'm, you know, this is very enjoyable to study without question. It's, it's good to know and important to know, but I'm looking forward to getting into some of the, the real meat of the life of Jesus itself. Um, you know, with all the, his teachings, um, his, uh, his doctrine, his the things that he did, the miracles that he did, um, it's just, that's exciting stuff. But what this is pointing out, that he came into the world um, the same way we all did. And no doubt, I mean, thinking about his early life here, before we even get into this part now, um, I guess as, as normal as it could have been, he lived a normal life. Um, it makes me wonder, you know, as he began to understand things, you know, um, maybe around the age of four or five, when a, a child starts to become self-aware and question a lot of things, it makes me wonder what was going on in the mind of this child and when it really, he really had the understanding of, of who he was. We'll get a glimpse of that in this, this account here now in Luke's gospel. So starting in verse 22, as we read, Again, hopefully you have your Bibles with me and open to Luke chapter 2, verse 22. It says, when the days of her purification according to the law of Moses were accomplished, uh, that is Mary, of course, giving birth to Jesus, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. 
as it is written in the law of the Lord, every male that opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. And in no case was this more true than in this event right here. Uh, Mary and Joseph were very obedient um, Jews. You know, another interesting thing that just kind of came into my mind um, as we kind of steamroll through their early years here, two years at least, and then even up to six years um, later on, and 12 actually, um, they weren't married when Jesus was born. It doesn't tell us when they got married. Um, so we don't really know that. They did, um, obviously, I believe, uh, got married um, as the plan was for them. But certainly things changed with the birth of this child here. It was a, it was a game changer, to, to say the least, um, in their life. But uh, it certainly changed everything um, uh, as far as their plans were concerned for themselves. Uh, but they were faithful is what the point that I wanted to make. They were raised faithful Jews. They, they stayed faithful Jews. They raised their children according to the law. Um, they were not perfect, but they were law-abiding Jews. They were faithful to the law of Moses. And again, in this case here, they brought Jesus um, to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. And there's a, a prophecy, or not a prophecy, but a verse uh, that is recorded here um, about that event. Every male that opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. Verse 24, and to offer a sacrifice according to that which is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons, and that was done as well. And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. The same man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Ghost was upon him. Boy, that's a statement. This man, Simeon, whom we don't know much about, Three verses here really are no a little bit more than that, but there's only a few verses here uh, that are dedicated to this man. But that first verse, as we're introduced to him, says an awful lot about this man. And I think there were, as, as messed up as Israel was religiously, as far as the faith is concerned, there were um, there were some jewels in Israel at this time. Simeon here was an elderly man, faithful man, a just man. He says he was devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel, the coming of Messiah, God's revelation to Israel. Um, and it says the Holy Ghost was upon him. The Holy Spirit was upon him, probably answering his prayers as he prayed to, to have this revelation and understanding before he died. God honored that. Verse 26, it says, it was, it was revealed unto him by the Holy Ghost that he should not see death before he see the Lord's Christ. Did I mention this regarding the word Christ? Um, I'll talk about Jesus' name a little bit. The name Jesus is um, the Old Testament name Joshua. Um, his New Testament name Jesus, the Greek version, I suppose it would be, uh, as we pronounce it, uh, Jesus. Um, it's, it means the Lord saves or the Lord delivers. And there were several Joshuas, of course, in the Old Testament, um, one being the successor of, of Moses, uh, the great uh, leader, Joshua, in the Old Testament. Um, but that's what that name means. Christ is not his, Jesus' last name. Christ is a description of who this one is, distinguishing him really from any other Jesus or Yeshua or Joshua, which is all the same, um, making identifying him as the Christ. The word Christ means anointed, um, and specifically, as it's identified, the anointed one, the Messiah. And the word Messiah uh, is an Old Testament word that we're probably familiar with, but uh, ironically enough, the word Messiah is only found twice in the Old Testament. Um, I believe it's just twice, but a few times in the Old Testament, uh, the word Messiah is found. 
it, it's, it means anointed. Same thing as the word Christ. They're, they're interchangeable words from different, um, different cultures, different um, languages. But they mean the same thing. They mean anointed, one that is set apart. This one is specifically speaking of the one that was to come through Abraham's seed, the promised seed of Abraham. This is what um, Simeon here is looking for. He knew because of the signs of the time that were all around him, he knew the time was right for this promise to be fulfilled. And I've been trying to make some connections with the, the coming, this coming of Jesus, the first coming of Jesus, and the second coming of Jesus. And I think those that are faithful in today's world, in today's age, should be aware of what's going on because the time is coming where he is going to come again the second time just as promised in the scriptures. And we need to be looking for it, praying for it, and try as best we can to be counted as this man was here, as faithful and just, and asking the Holy Spirit of God to guide us in understanding these things. But he looked forward to this, and he wanted to see it. So now at verse 27, it says, He came by the Spirit into the temple. And when the parents, that is Mary and Joseph, brought in the child, Jesus, to do for him after the custom of the law, then took he, Simeon, him, Jesus, in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now lettest thou thy servant de depart in peace according to thy word, for mine eyes have seen thy salvation. He did not see Jesus grow up not from a child into young adulthood, not as an adult when he started his ministry. He died probably soon after this, but he saw what he needed to see. Um, he needed to see no more. Um, his time was fulfilled, and he died in peace knowing uh, that God has fulfilled his promise and kind of passing the baton now to the next generation. I love that um, about this man. We don't know anything about him other than this. Um, anything to add to this really would be just surmising guesswork. Uh, we might be able to look at some ancient records such as Josephus, the Jewish historian, uh, who writes regarding these times. But as far as the scripture record is concerned, this is all we know of this man. But what it says speaks volumes of his character. <clears throat> we could say this, that it would be the kind of character that we want to be honored in this way. It continues on um, after that statement, Mine eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou hast prepared before the face of all people. Um, a light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of thy people Israel. He mentions the Gentiles. He was a man of understanding, knowing what all of these things were leading up to. And that is the Gentiles being uh, included in these promises that God made to Abraham. Verse 33 now says, And Joseph and his mother marveled at these things which were spoken of him. And Simeon blessed them and said unto them, <clears throat> Mary his mother, Behold, this child is set for the fall and rising of many in Israel, and for a sign which shall be spoken against. Yea, a sword shall pierce through thy own soul also, that the thoughts of many hearts might be revealed. Now it kind of shifts gears now to another uh, woman that doesn't speak much about, <coughs> but it's a great testimony to her. <coughs> Excuse me, one minute. There was sparkling water. A little bit of advertising there for you. So now we're introduced to a woman in verse 36. So there was a, one Anna, a prophetess, a daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. She was of great age and had lived with a husband seven years from her virginity. And she was a widow of about fourscore and four years which departed from the temple and served God with fastings 
and prayers night and day. This was a woman that was dedicated to the Lord. I don't know for sure. This is just guesswork on my part because of some of the things that it says about her and her dedication. But what the Catholic Church has as um, the only thing I know of it as is uh, the nuns of the church, women who are expected to be um, unmarried, really married to the church, uh, somewhat in this fashion here, remain virgins, never be with a man, um, and dedicate themselves in this way. I don't know if this may be taken from this passage or not concerning this woman and maybe a few others, but nothing about what the Catholics have as the nuns and their position. None of it is really scriptural. Um, that itself is a um, another way of bringing paganism in ancient, ancient practices going back long before the Catholic Church and even before this time, bringing it into Christianity. But nonetheless, <clears throat> back to this woman here, um, speaks of her. Doesn't say others need to be like this as, as far as a commandment, but um, she was a great woman. So she was dedicated to the Lord. She was a prophetess. Might talk some about that uh, another time as well, a prophetess. Um, and, and prophets as well. So verse 38 says she was coming in um, that instant and gave thanks likewise unto the Lord and spake of him uh, to all the people who look for redemption in Israel. When they had performed the things according to the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee to their own city, Nazareth. So now things kind of begin to speed up a little bit um, after that event. So verse 40 says, Now the child grew and waxed strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. Jesus, this child. That's why I asked the question earlier. Makes me wonder about this time, really, you know, when he began to have the understanding of who he was. But there's an interesting thing that happens here. It's kind of humorous in some ways. When you think about it, probably not humorous for mom and dad when it was happening, but verse 41 says, now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. And when he was 12 years old, so we go from the time he's about two or three years old, maybe a little bit more there, um, now he's 12 years old. So they went up to Jerusalem after the custom of the feast, and when they had fulfilled the days as they returned, the child Jesus tarried behind in Jerusalem, and Joseph uh, and his mother knew not of it. So, kind of like a home alone incident, if you will. They had, um, in a caravan of people, which was customary, they would go to Jerusalem from their different towns. Um, the faithful of the Jews would go for certain feasts throughout the year, and this one was a main event every year. Faithful Jews would make the trip to Jerusalem uh, for these feasts. And it would be a big event uh, for families to get together and celebrate the Passover event that took place in the days of Noah, when God called Israel out of Egypt. Um, so they did that. A company of people are all together. You know, family and friends were all together. And uh, when they packed up to head back home, uh, Jesus somehow stayed behind, and what it said was that his uh, mom and dad didn't know it. So verse 44 now says, But they, supposing him to have been with the company, went a day's journey, and they sought him among their kinfolk and acquaintances. When they found him not, they turned back to Jerusalem seeking him. I would imagine it was Mary and Joseph that went back, not the whole company. But Mary and Joseph went back looking for Jesus. It came to pass that after three days, <clears throat> they found him in the temple. Well, three days is a long time to be, you know, not, <laughs> no, I, I just thought of this, but, you know, here they've been given um, great responsibility of being the caretakers, the parents of uh, the Messiah. 
really watching him until God decides to use him uh, to reveal himself. And <laughs> now they realize that they've lost him. So they don't know what's going on. I don't see an indication here that, you know, God had kind of calmed their heart and led them to where he was. They, kind of one of those instances where they're on their own. So they're stressing, I would imagine, over the whole thing as they go look for Jesus. Then it says when they found him, um, oh, I, I wanna, I'm going too fast. Uh, so they went seeking him in Jerusalem. It says in verse 46, now it came to pass that after three days they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the doctors, both hearing them and asking questions. And all that heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. Twelve-year-old Jesus, sitting in the midst of doctors, teachers of the law, maybe Pharisees and Sadducees were here at this time, asking them questions, listening to what they're saying, and exactly how much understanding he had at this time isn't clear to us. We don't, we don't know those things, but it says, when they heard him, they were astonished at his understanding and his answers. These doctors were astonished. Verse 48 says, and when they saw him, they were amazed. When parents saw him, and his mother said unto him, Son, why hast thou dealt with us? Behold, thy father and I have sought thee in sorrowing. But he said unto them, one of the most infamous sayings of Jesus, how is it that you sought me? Why have you sought me? Wist ye not, know you not, that I must be about my father's business? And they understood not the saying which he spoken unto them. Shows a couple of things. Jesus is gaining understanding in who he is. Still, stay as a 12-year-old child, still staying very respectful, not only for the doctors, uh, the teachers that he was dealing with in the temple, but his own parents. I don't get the impression he's being flippant here with them, but he's starting to gain understanding of who he is. And them, it shows their, their human side. They were filled in on a lot of these things at his birth. But like all of us, I think, you know, we go through ups and downs with our faith and trying to um, make sense out of the spiritual and the, and the natural. And certainly no more is that the case than it is with, with Mary and Joseph being the um, caretakers, the parents of the Messiah. You know, when would it be time to let him loose, you know, let him go do what he's supposed to do? We're going to consider an event in a couple of weeks, uh, the first miracle that Jesus does uh, in Cana of Galilee, which is actually found in John's Gospel. Um, <clears throat> but finally, his mother realizes that it's time to to just let him do what he's going to do. But certainly it had to be hard for them as parents to make sense out of all of this. But he says, um, know you not, or wist you not, that I must be about my father's business. And they didn't understand uh, what he meant by that. So verse 51 now it says, he went down with them, came to Nazareth, and was subject to them not by constraint, but willingly. But his mother kept all these things in her heart. And the last thing that Luke says, before jumping ahead now uh, about, uh, what would it be, 17 years? 18 years? When Jesus is 30 years old? Um, it says in verse 52 that Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. And then Luke jumps right into chapter 3, which is introducing again John the Baptist, but this time with his purpose, which is to um, announce the Messiah and prepare the the way of the people for the coming of the Messiah. I'm going to stop with this for the evening, make a few final comments. Um, 
because there's a lot to get into with the coming chapters, but I want to kind of say a few things. I would like to ask those of you that are following along to read Luke chapter 3 and Matthew chapter 3. And we're going to consider um, the baptism of John. Um, the baptism of John and, um, well, John's baptism, basically the baptism of Jesus at the hands of John and John's ministry uh, coming to pass. And as, as I said um, at the beginning of this, I do want to address some of the questions that were asked because I've, I, I guess I'm coming across as a little bit harsh on the, the Roman Catholic Church with uh, references I've used such as that she is evil. The Catholic Church is evil. And I do believe that, by the way. I don't believe the Catholic people are evil themselves. I believe that the system itself, with almost everything about it, from the Pope, its hierarchy system, Pope, the cardinals, the bishops, priesthood, all of that is unscriptural. There's nothing about that in the scriptures to indicate that that should identify the church. In fact, it is just the opposite of what we see in the scriptures. So I am going to, over the next week, I'm going to, I'm going to look at some things to kind of bring in some answers to the questions, the good questions that were asked. And like I said, I myself uh, had thought about those things. And you know, one of the things that I thought when I was uh, really starting to consider what I myself believed um, and about the Catholic Church, I, I really didn't know what I believed as a Catholic. My, my whole faith system was in the fact that that's what I've always been. And one of my thoughts was, how can a church that is that big and that old, millions upon millions of people that are Catholics, how can they all be wrong? It didn't make any sense to me because it's so big and so religiously majestic. Um, how can it be wrong? Well, it is. <laughs> I've, I've come to that conclusion. What we're going to see in the scriptures with the ministry of Jesus, the organization of his church, the simplicity of his the doctrines, the warnings of those that are going to come in and try to corrupt this system and make it into something it's not, the idea of wolves in sheep's clothing, um, angels of darkness coming in, and disguising themselves as angels of light. He mentions all these things. In fact, um, in one place, in fact, just real quick, just to close out um, this evening. And I'll address this a little bit more next week as we get into some of these things, start getting into the, the ministry of Christ. We're going to spend quite a bit of time in Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7 once we get to this particular stage of Jesus' ministry. <clears throat> um, I'm using my new Bible here and I don't have it marked like I do in my old Bible. And I hope that I can find it quickly enough that I don't, where I don't bore you and I'm not seeing it. But there is one place where Jesus mentions, um, I think I'm pretty close to it. Well, verse 15 might be good. He warns his church. He says, beware of false prophets, which come up, which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. You shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so, every good tree brings forth good fruit, but every corrupt tree brings forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that brings not, uh, and so on and Oh, verse 21 is what I'm looking for. So not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that does the will of my Father, which is in heaven, many will say in that day, the day of judgment, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name and in thy name cast out devils and in thy name done many wonderful works? And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you depart from me that work iniquity. Now. I do believe that the Catholic Church is of that sort, along with many other religious organizations. They're using the name of Jesus. 
They're impressive in what they're doing, the works that they're doing, but they're not according to the scriptures. And that's the problem. And that's one thing I, I really want to try to stress, challenging those of you that I know, as far as my family, those that I know and love, to think about the things that you have been taught concerning the Word of God, concerning your religious beliefs. Think about them. If you, if you accept the Catholic Church as being the way that uh, we're supposed to serve God, I'm not going to judge you. That's not my place to judge you. But I am going to challenge you that if you believe the Word of God to be the final authority in all things, compare what that system says with what the Word of God says. And you will find out that the two don't add up. They don't mesh together. So even just in studying the birth of Christ, you know, we, we see some discrepancies um, concerning Mary and some of the things that we are taught. And they're not minor things. They're major, major, um, they're not errors in doctrine. They're, it, they're misleading people uh, down a path of, of really unbelief in um, the truth of the word of God. So I'm going to conclude with that this evening. Um, thank you for paying attention. I hope it's been a blessing for you. Um, I love looking into the Word of God. I love talking about it. I would, much, to be honest, much rather be in a, a with you all here with me in my front room, you know, talking and having dialogue together. But um, I'm hoping this will eventually work out to some, be something that we can have good dialogue back and forth. So uh, that's my prayer. Um, again, hopefully it's been a blessing for you. Please send me questions, responses, agreements, disagreements. Let me know what you think with uh, some of the things we're looking at here. Um, and hopefully we can, um, you know, get into some good discussion. Thank you, and God bless all of you. Have a good evening. Bye now.